then you're very welcome back we're going to go through the Sunday papers happy to say Gavin Kumsky of the Irish Times is here in studio and Michael Lester will be joining us in just a moment he's en route four or five minutes away we're told that's how these license pay people do it you know Oh well, he's top pro. I've no worries there. <laughs> Michael Lester on the way. So the back page is in no particular order. Sun Sport, they have well Galway at the top and uh, Westmeath as well. Maroon Thrive. So good day for uh, both players in the maroon jerseys yesterday. And then beneath that, fill your boots. This is Phil Foden, and you'll be pleased to hear that financially Phil is doing just fine. He's uh, jumped up to two hundred thousand pounds a week in his new deal at Manchester City. Then the uh, mirror. This is uh, Martinez War. Ten Hag target at loggerheads with Ajax as Dutch club up price to fifty million pounds. So Manchester United struggling to land some of their targets at the moment. Money being the issue. Uh, sports star Ron's had enough. Again, this has been the theme of the week around Manchester United. Ronaldo wants out, and beneath that, which is rather grim, major United sponsors need superstar to stay. So it seems some of the pressure on Manchester United is coming from sponsors. Let's keep Ronaldo. He brings in the eyeballs. Sunday World, they have Hot Port. This is Andrew Porter. Not every day you score two tries en route to beating the All Blacks on Kiwi soil. New Zealand 12, Ireland 23. John Brennan there on the front page writing about that. And Con gone is big blow to dubs. This is Con O'Callaghan. Almost certainly. I mean, it's going to be like Lazarus here, but almost certain to miss today's game. Uh, half past Probably three. a very serious injury or it could be nothing at all. We just don't know, do we? Uh, we don't have a clue, no. The rumours are a hairline fracture and those rumours are openly discussed but I, I I, mean, they could have been plucked from a WhatsApp group for all I know. It's very quiet. So. Desi Farrell's quote is pretty good on it, isn't it? Pretty helpful. Which is? Uh, I don't know. He didn't even confirm what the injury was. He That's refused right, to confirm the injury. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mail on Sunday, big picture of Johnny Sexton. Uh, you would have to say it was an extraordinary performance. Ronan O'Gara is in the show later and he said it was as good a performance from Sexton as he's ever seen. 37 years of age. If there was a way to wrap this guy up in cotton wool and parachute him in for a quarterfinal in the World Cup, it might just be the way to do it. Farrell won serious success after Ireland's historic Dunedin victory and Sunday Times, similar picture of Sexton, thumbs up to the crowd, unbelievable. Uh, we gone from first test thrashing. Ireland claim historic win over All Blacks in New Zealand. And front page of the Sunday Independent History Makers. Main picture is Andrew Porter celebrating beneath that Johnny Sexton. Thumbs up to the crowd. Brilliant Porter and Sexton. The dominant Ireland to first test win against All Blacks in New Zealand. Let's start with your old beat. You're a football man now, of course, Indeed, Gaff. Indeed, yep. But, uh, rugby for many years. What coverage caught your eye on Ireland 23, New Zealand 12? Yeah, uh, I thought Rory Keane did a good report just in the, the mail on Sunday. Uh, simply, just he was—he's obviously sitting there in Dunedin in the stand, and he looks up before he files, and he sees that it's not the players are on the pitch, pretty calm. It's not a lap of honour. It's a—we've done what we've been trying to do for an awfully long time, and uh, I actually found it hard to get really. Uh, even it was probably too early in the morning, but it's very hard to get passionately into it because I was so convinced that they were gonna. What was going to happen is what always happens, you know, but. Um, New Zealand got New Zealand couldn't keep their had these halfbacks who couldn't get the job done so it was what it was we went we, we turned to Frano uh, as we said to, us, to each other just before we came on air uh, you always look at Frano first to, see, to Neil Francis to see what he's saying you know um, a little bit mean spirited towards uh, the All Blacks coach uh, Brandon McLean granted the Ardi Sevilla uh, sub mix up um, cost him the game un- unquestionably I think uh, it's a big mistake to make as New Zealand head coach. Yeah, it is a big mistake. Um, it's also a major flaw in the sport. We saw it in the Ireland-Italy Six Nations match as well earlier on this, this year. It just destroys the game. Didn't destroy the game from an Irish perspective, but it does from, for everyone else mm. watching. You know, it does for the sport. Um, and it would have been nice to beat them with Ardi Sevilla because the way they were going, the way they had... Didn't they look like Leinster? Weren't they actually playing with a flow like Leinster again? Um, yeah, Frano was he, he's, uh, very good. He... He's the one who gets the quote, Peter Manny's quote to uh, Sam Kane, which people were thinking. I missed this. Did you miss this at the time? No, I could see it. Yeah, I was really enjoying it. Uh, Omani laughing and joking in the opposite, his opposite number's face is rare. So okay. when you see it, I was, I was very giddy to find out what he said. And well, Frano quotes him saying, you're just a shit, Richie McCall. Basically, maybe for sport, maybe for spite, Omani got into a tangle with the all-black captain, Sam Kane, after the whistle from the referee... Yako Piper's microphone O'Mahony could be heard letting them have it again if you've got kids in the car turn off for a moment uh, who do you think you are you're a shit Richie McCall pal 
end quote. Some typically direct Munster invective. And after being play- outplayed all afternoon, Kane had no answer because it was true. Kane has been bang average for years, and this could be his final. That's not true. I uh, think. Series. He just came back from a broken neck, and he's a, he's a, he's a, one of the best open sides in the world. Got op- I played by Josh van der Fleer, but uh, the New Zealand back row completely outplayed this Irish back row last week, mm. and they put forty odd points on them. Now this week, again, there's an asterisk slightly because Artie Artie Savio, the best player, probably the best player in the world at the moment, was taken out of the game. But the Ireland back row, even still. You have to give so much credit to Caelan Doris's performance was just unbelievably good. So physically effective was the thing that normally doesn't happen with Irish back rowers. Yeah. Neil Francis talks about the back row. Caelan Doris uh, made amends for a quiet game in Auckland, now has the number eight slot nailed on. Jack Conan and Doris are too similar in style to be in the same back row. It's a much better back row with O'Mahony at six, he says. And Neil Francis says, Josh van der Fleer is the best open side flanker in the world and he has been for two years. It seems churlish to revert to stats, but his 21 tackles without a miss seems to be incongruous with everything he does around the park. Just how did he manage to fit those tackles in with all the other stuff he does? Best in the world. I think him and Curry are the two best, probably. Yeah. Um, but for the last year, yeah, Van der Fleur has taken his game to a whole other level physically. So, yeah. Um, it's, uh, I wouldn't have said it myself, but fair enough. You know, yes. he certainly play, he certainly played what people consider to be the best open side in the world. So. He sure is. Michael Lester, you're very welcome to studio. Gav, how are you? Joe, how's the form? Are you well? Uh, very well, very good well. Good stuff, good stuff. You're live on the air, by the way. Live on the air, fair enough. The way Don't you use like any bad language, in other words. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I get it. We've already broken that rule ourselves here, actually, reading uh, <laughs> Peter O'Mahony's comments to Sam Kane. We're just talking about the coverage of the rugby yesterday, which, yeah. as you can imagine, is pretty complimentary. So, uh, Neil Francis as well said, Ireland played without fear or mental restraint, restraint in Dunedin. Uh, you shipped 42 points the previous week. It's very easy to retreat into your shell. That's why this victory is all the more special. A gripping test match. So he's pretty effusive there. On the Foster comments you mentioned, Gav, he says, Foster's a clown. Uh, <laughs> he, made, he made the huge mistake of taking off his best forward, Sevea. It's not Piper's fault that Foster doesn't know the rules. Uh, if New Zealand lose next week, Foster is gone and Joe Schmidt is in which is a pity because we'll meet New Zealand in the quarterfinals again in France and I was rather hoping Foster would still be bumbling along in charge uh, and he does make the point as well a good one yesterday's test was to be uh, was in a windless dry ball it was a test of skill which Ireland won comfortably because it was beneath obviously a roof uh, next week heavy rain and a gale forecast for Wellington an entirely different type of match Wayne Barnes in charge the arresting question here is what are you prepared to do to win the series that is why we watch the games. So, geez, it's all, all set up. What a difference a week makes because going into this tour, uh, everybody was saying this is, this is going to be a bad experience for Ireland. And certainly on the evidence of last weekend, um, when it seemed, I mean, look, New Zealand were the better team anyway, but then anything that could go wrong from an Irish point of view seemed to go wrong. Little things, fumbles of the ball here and there. And then yesterday we saw a completely different situation. I think it was a combination. And it's, it's interesting that if you look at the papers today, with all that's going on in sport, and there's a lot this weekend. It's dominating, of course it is. And it's not just the fact that Ireland uh, won yesterday, but the manner in which they won. Uh, but I think also the All Blacks have to take a little bit of responsibility on themselves for that because their discipline was not good yesterday. They had a man sent off. They should have had a second guy sent off for that flying tackle. How he stayed in the pitch is anybody's guess. But however, that's, that's just Piper, rules is rules. Mm. Jacob Piper was determined. Even the, the red card for the, the tight head prop... Mm. Uh, Gary Ringrose's arms were flaying in the air and Jakob Piper walks over and his quote is uh, it doesn't look like anything foul he's talking to his TMO he's talking yeah, to his yeah, touch yeah. judges and Piper's trying to find a way out of giving red cards because they've already moved past red cards down in New Zealand and Southern Hemisphere it's 20 minutes for red cards in there they've been trialling that for the last year Yes, they don't want it, it, yes it ruins games but they're 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 lean, they lean towards uh, keep the game competitive as opposed to protect the player. Whether they, they like it or not, like that's, the evidence is mounting, you know? Sure, yeah. But um, I, I think next week, obviously, is going to be interesting on, on the, the basis of, of what happened yesterday. And I guarantee you, I've been in New Zealand, Joe, on Lions tours and all that kind of stuff. I, I fully get their passion for rugby. I mean, in New Zealand, it is rugby, it is rugby. And then after that, rugby. It's like Kilkenny, really. Like. A, well, it, it is, but on a, on a, on a national scale. Yeah, you yeah. know, they're really not interested in soccer and they're not interested in a lot of other things. Uh, but somebody, somebody is going to get hung 
this week in New Zealand as a result of this candy. If you know, they don't take these things lightly. And are you, an, are you anticipating an incredibly physical effort next week on their part? On their part, yes, because, I mean, that's part of their game. Yeah. It's that physicality. It's, I'm, you, I'm thinking said, of the... Remember like what a, they did after Chicago? I was just going to say... Well, of course they did, of course. Yeah. Piper let them that do was the, that. The Robbie Henshaw tackle. Robbie Henshaw yeah. tackle. Mm. Uh, Zebo was nearly decapitated by uh, Malachi Fekatoa, yeah. who's signing for Munster now, and that was a yellow. You know, he just gave a yellow for, like, what was it? The, the last iron, even under those old Yeah, goals. the last home series they lost was 1994. Yes. To the French. I can't, to, to tell you the truth, I can't see them uh, losing next weekend. But however, uh, let's take positives out of this. And the positives is yesterday and that kind of performance by Ireland across the pitch. I thought there was an interesting thing yesterday that happened at half time in the game when New Zealand had taken the hits mm -hmm. and yet there were only three points down. And some of the, the, the grinning that was going on amongst themselves, did you see that, Gavin, as they were going off the pitch? They were more or less saying to themselves, do you know what? We we're only three points yeah. down. We survived all that. We're going to hammer these guys in the second half. But in fact, it was Ireland that, that upped their performance. And uh, fair play. Their mm. arrogance is on a level. Uh, their pre-match arrogance has been on a level. I'm pre-tour of this. Is they do not know any of the Irish players' names. I, I'd even push, like, do they know who Ty Byrne is now? Did they even bother to take note of that performance from him? Like, Shawnee O'Brien, like Paul O'Connell, obviously, Brian O'Driscoll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They never, ever gave O'Gara any credit because they didn't think he was physical up to it. But they gave Shawnee O'Brien his credit but only in 2017. They have no respect for the Irish players. There was their main TV show before the tour. They all started laughing before them on, on the panel when it was talking about Ireland winning a test in yeah, this yeah. test series. You know, burst out laughing. And then they go, oh yeah, you got you got to show your respect to this team. They're a very good team. They have Sexton. Um, <laughs> yeah. They have... And the other fellas. And then they start mentioning <laughs> the Kiwis in the team. They have James <laughs> Gibson. <laughs> James Gibson. And you course, know they yeah, don't respect course, them yeah. because yeah. they let them leave, you know what I mean? Mm, um, and yeah. Bundy Aki, though, I think, they, I think they have to respect him now. I think yeah. everyone does. I thought he was fantastic when he came on. Yeah. I thought he changed the game because he pushed Ireland over the game line. There's something that we, you've never no, seen yeah, happen in these Look, they were all excellent. Uh, uh, you know, looking around the pitch, there was performances everywhere. I, I'm, just, I'm just kind of slightly bemused to come in and have a chat... The, the day after Galway have qualified for the all Ireland football final and here I am talking about rugby. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. We will get there. Don't worry, you can go large. By the way, Stuart Barnes just in his piece, because obviously it's, it, it's good to get a view from an outsider and a neutral. Uh, he was paying tribute to Johnny Sexton as well, uh, sublime distribution and then he gave Ty Byrne huge mention as well. The Munsterlock's ability to find his way past Kiwi tacklers and over the gain line was the link between the tall, thin fly half and his burly, loose head prop, Andrew Porter. But he says that his performance, Ty Burns, eclipsed Paul O'Connell's towering effort against England in 07. And I thought the most complimentary thing he said was of Ireland's previous wins against New Zealand. He said, in the past, Ireland have beaten New Zealand with their non-stop work rate and their breakdown brilliance. He said this was different. This was far more of a cerebral victory. So Stuart well, Barnes with the He makes up. a good point in that article that said it took 36 minutes for New Zealand to get over the Ireland 10 metre line to get into Irish territory. I, it was an insane mm. start. That's Leinster against Munster for the last five years. Yeah. That's Stuart Lancaster sure. just outwitting. Yeah. Yeah. It's just pure coaching. It's O'Connell taking um, a disciple of Joe Schmidt when it comes to coaching, you know. It's O'Connell. Um, there's a picture at halftime where the entire squad, it just flashed on uh, on the break. The entire Ireland squad are looking at something. They're looking at a presentation. It's either Farrell or O'Connell because right. you can't see them in the background. Yeah, yeah. And one of them is giving a very, very succinct lecture on how the second half is going to be played, coaching them. And the gallery were just transfixed mm -hmm. in what was being said. I'd love to know who it was. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, Coaching-wise, Stuart Barnes is on the money. Uh, Farrell and O'Connell's coaching. And the, without, the, without John Fogarty's scrum, without that scrum, you, you you will ship 40 points in New Zealand every single time if your scrum and line-out are not dominant well, on you your mentioned own possession. Neil Francis, last week he was saying Fogarty needs to sort this out because it is becoming a trend. So there was a degree of pressure on him there. Yeah, and as soon as you lose Porter or, or Tyke for a long, sure, yeah. the whole thing is, is, is a house of cards. What of Andy Farrell then, Michael? Because he got off to uh, a so-so start. You know, he was the continuity candidate, but then things had gone badly under the last year of Schmidt and we were wondering, God, where is this going to go under Farrell? Because... Bernard Jackman says here that Farrell is now looking more and more at home as an international coach. And he makes the point as well that Farrell has now beaten New Zealand six times, once with England, once mm -hmm. with the Lions, and now four times with Ireland. Only the former Australian coach Bob Dwyer has beaten them more, and that's only on seven occasions. So, I mean, Farrell's 
record against New Zealand alone is extraordinary. But he has really grown into this job, hasn't he? He has. And, and of course, it's always going to take a bit of time uh, when you're coming into a situation like that and what had been there before that. And Joe Schmidt obviously was so well regarded, uh, rightly so, obviously, from an Irish point of view and going through that success that they had. You just can't simply hand it over. The Dobbs have found this, you know, with Jim Gavin when he stepped down. It's taken them time to find their feet again, and we're going to find out today whether they will succeed in doing that. And, and it's interesting, you're looking at other, other sports and other teams, like Eric uh, Ten Hag, who has gone in at Manchester United. Like, this is not going to be easy. I don't care how good he is, because it's been like uh, revolving doors with managers going in and out, kind of. And, and he has his problems even before he begins, because he's now got a player who actually wants out, but nobody wants him, Ronaldo. And uh, Hag wants him <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, it, it's it's. But you see what I mean? It's yeah, a difficult yeah, situation yeah. if you've got a guy in your squad that really doesn't want to play for you. You know, I would say, look, I'll, I'll tell you what, Cristiano, sit this out. Thanks yeah. very much. You're right, though. It took Farrell a while to get the bright personnel that he wanted. Mm. Like even getting this Mac Hansen guy. Uh, yeah. The recruitment process is still two schools on the Rock Road, a boarding school down in, outside Clain and New Zealanders on the granny rule. That's still the recruitment process for Irish rugby. It's not that all-inclusive. Like, mm. like oh, the, sure, Ar yeah. the Irish football team looks like modern Ireland, you know what I mean, if you look at it now. Because mm. uh, uh, the day you, um, the day Ireland or the Irish rugby gets a foothold in places like, uh, or gets a foothold back in Limerick and gets a places in, goes into West Dublin and all that, they'll be competed, competitive in every World Cups in New Zealand. That's still the ceiling. Like they're, this is a huge step forward because they've won a second test in prime. You see, this New Zealand team are supposed to be in their prime nick, prime condition, a year out from a World Cup, and it's the second test. Mm. So this is new ground, and they deserve enormous credit for it. Um, but yeah, it's about getting the right players around. You, that a coach can't be successful until he has what he needs, Correct, what yeah. he's demanded, he wants. There are a few uh, caveats, I would say, in several reports as well, that there is no doubt Andy Farrell is choosing to prioritise this series over preparing depth for the World Cup. So I suspect in 15 months' time, if we're not feeling generous and Ireland bow out at a certain stage, we might be looking back on this test saying, well, shouldn't he have blooded players? But for the time being, everybody effusive in their praise. Just one last piece on the rugby to get your thoughts on. Brendan Fanning last week wrote a, wrote a brilliant, I suppose it was a catalogue of the various errors which were made in the Jeremy Lockman HIA situation and just the HIA uh, protocol generally. So he's followed it up this week and he does ask the question, which I have to say did occur to me as well. Uh, he was wondering firstly why it wasn't a red card for the hit on Mac Hansen, which yeah. we've covered. But secondly, he said, the second question why Hansen was not removed for a HIA. World rugby officials must be on the edge of their seats every week waiting for the latest interpretations of their laws, legislation they manage in the expectation of one day having to stand over them in court, is what Brendan Fanning writes here. And he says um, they must rue the transition from the bad old days of Gary Owens landing on a fullback who then disappeared under a stampede of studs to the current fad where box kicking uh, opens the door to all sorts of sickening collisions. We had Barry O'Driscoll on the show uh, during the week and one of the questions I was trying to ask him is like in his medical opinion is it possible looking at a hit to the head to know whether that's just a HIA or if mm. actually it's so sufficient to just say well you skip the HIA you're out of the game. Well Lachman that was a perfect example. Yeah because Lachman was dizzy and he was clearly gone but Barry O'Driscoll was saying in his opinion he, he doesn't see how it's possible. If you know the medical profession is safety first. If someone gets hit in the head there's a risk, you take sure, them out. Sure, yeah. But for Mac Hansen not even to have the HIA, I think is a fair question for Brendan Fanning to ask because we're saying it was bad enough to get a red to warrant a red card, but not significant enough to warrant a HIA. No, it, 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 you're dead right, and, and Fanning is, is right on this topic as well because you have to, I guess, simply err on the side of extreme caution in situations like this. And, you know, back in the day in sport, I remember Galway were playing an All-Ireland Harding semi-final years ago. Eugene Clunan was the free taker on that team and he took a very, very heavy hit. Uh, as in, he asked Joe Rabbit, where am I? And Galway had got a free out of it. And Rabbit said to him, Eugene, you're in Croke Park, you're taking a free and you're going to score this, which he actually did. Yeah. But the guy hadn't a clue where he was at this the stage. The rugby lads are told to look up at the big screen because you can find out where the stadium is. So when you go into your <laughs> HIA, you can go, oh, I'm in Sungorp. Uh, yeah. What's the score? Just check the score Just before you leave yeah, your yeah, HIA. Yeah. You know? I actually did a HIA. A bunch of journalists did it a couple of years ago. I failed mine. And it was like a mor morning, Tuesday morning. You know, They put us through them. They brought us in from the pitch and showed us that they are tricky enough. But oh, no, uh, yeah. Sorry, Gavin, is that just you would have failed it generally anyway? I, feel, I failed it generally, yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> 
couldn't walk the line, you know. Do you not have to fail against your own baseline, no? Yeah, well, they were establishing my baseline that day, obviously. Okay, and you was below the average Yeah, I was way, way down. Okay. They told me I wouldn't be going back onto the pitch. Because uh, Johnny Sexton was actually saying during the week that they've lowered the baseline of the HIA to take into account that you might have done your HIA at the start of the season when you're fresh in the morning and just had your coffee versus when you mm. come off after playing for yeah. an hour that they've made it easier. But he said it's still very tricky well, to pass. Dr Driscoll is, is said it because of all this grey area that we're now entering in yeah. this conversation, that's why he stepped away from World Rugby's medical boards and all that. Again, uh, Johnny Sexton, it does appear that his HIA one was earring on the side of caution. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And that's why they took him off. Because there was two incidents with Heffern and Lockman the week before. Okay. And he suffered, and he got dragged through the media again in the last week, and he Which was he trying. He came out and he tried to say... But nobody hears him. The noise is always too deafening. But then again, you pull off Mac Hansen. He's straight in again. HIA two, HIA three, and it's everyone's examining this. Something. Well, Dr. Frank just goes on the record saying it's not fit for purpose. Uh, and world will be come back strongly and go. Well, what do you want us to do? Pack up the tent. You know, yeah. we have to do something. So, yeah. it's well, there's, there's obviously a, a huge element of opinion. Uh, in all of this. In other words, it is not absolutely scientific. I mean, one doctor might say one thing, I and mean, we all know this generally in medicine, mm. and somebody else might give you a different conclusion out of it, you know, so... Look. In the biggest games, it, te- it tends to disappear. Like, I still remember the, the decisive Lions test, New Zealand Lions test in 2017, where or it, it just stopped the, the whole HIV. The idea of HIA went away, like, you know, right. in those yes, games. Yeah, yeah. So in the big games, so next week is a massive game, right? It's a test series where... And so a Northern Hemisphere team can actually win a test series in New Zealand. It's going to be ferocious, mm. and there's going to be there's going to be incidents. It's guaranteed, and it'll just be very interesting to see how they manage it. Very interesting. Can I turn to the Sunday World, page uh, sixteen and seventeen? Not even in the sports section. Why I quit the Sunday game mm. at Spillan. Right. Did you know this was coming? I did actually. Yeah, Pat told me this a couple of months ago. Um, in actual fact, when you go into the newsstands, as I did this morning into the shop, the first thing that I see is Pat Splann's picture on the front of the Sunday World, apart from the sports pages yeah. in it and the middle pages there and all that. And it's it's all the same uh, idea of why I quit the Sunday game. Um, I know from talking to Pat about it, I know he just wasn't quite entirely happy in the setup this last while. And plus, it's also, as he says himself, his, his philosophy about life is leave on your own terms, mm. as he did in his playing days, as he did in his teaching career when he took early retirement and that and he he decide he likes to think that it's better to just walk away before you're actually shown the door mm. so and, and i and get it that it is a different setup now as well isn't it? it's done differently it is a year. different setup it's it's it has changed over the last for for one reason or other for the last uh, while but um but having said that i have to say pat is going to be missed on the program i don't care whether you liked him or didn't like him or agreed with his opinions or didn't agree with him and that Himself and Brawley and, and O'Rourke and all that kind of thing, they were box office, you know. And together. Yeah, together. Yeah. When they're round, and yeah, they, were, yeah. they were the ideal combination because Pat was the performer, Joe was the loose cannon, and Colin was there, the go-to man, when things were getting really silly, mm. kind of, that you could get to kind of bring it back from the edge, <laughs> and if you know. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the way it goes. Well, to give you a sense of what he's saying, there's no, I mean, he, 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 like ever the salesman, he said yesterday on the television, I'll be writing about my reasons tomorrow in the Sunday World. Well, he got the plug in, I heard. Yeah. <laughs> so he's like, oh God, what's what's Spillane going to reveal here? There's yeah. no great revelation. No, there isn't really. No, no. He says, I'll be 67 on my next birthday. The four and a half to five hour drive from Dublin to uh, Kerry after the programme finished on Sunday nights were be- beginning to take their toll. In recent years, the enjoyment I used to get from working on the programme had started to wane. It had become a chore. The increasing scrutiny, the criticism on social media and just the pressure of being part of such an iconic programme had started to exact a toll on my health. And he referenced Ursula Jacobs' comments Mm -hmm. last week and he said maybe this is probably the first year or so that the criticism on social media has started to get to me for the first time. He says, uh, in recent years and more particularly in recent months, the comments appearing on social media have become vile, personal and ageist. Uh, But to be clear the abuse I received on social media is not the reason uh, I'm quitting. And uh, he talks about his happiest time on the programme and it was with you, Michael. We couldn't have timed this better, by the way. We didn't know uh, this was <laughs> going to happen, but it was, was the, it was with you and with Joe and with Colm. And he said, going on, no script, a bit wild. He said it was uh, magical. There were no scripts. It was like taking a ride on the magic carpet. It was great fun. Yeah, I, I had a script. It's just they never listened to it. It, was uh, that. it does suggest he feels it has lost some of that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Joe, it's it's not 
I'm not too comfortable talking about this for obvious reasons. Yeah, I you know, because it would sound like I'm going down the it was all better in my day course, kind of thing. Course, you know, everything changes. You know, that's that's a simple fact of life. Everything changes and eras change on programmes, whether they're the Sunday game or whatever else it is, or the rugby or you know, so on. Um but but certainly there were there were great days there. Yes, there were there were troublesome days and there's no doubt about that with the panel. I mean some of it just simply wasn't easy. In actual fact on the two pages you have open there in the Sunday world on the right hand side there you have Sean McGoldrick um, writing through some of you can look at it there yourself oh, yeah. actually Gavin um, Sean McGoldrick is writing about some of the incidents kind of down through the years that that uh, stood out from Pat's point of view in terms of some of the controversy puke that he caused yeah. Yeah. puke football all being. them with apologies yeah. that they do yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, what the, was the um, atmosphere like when say he says something I have it here so for instance Puke football, uh, thuggery remark, Clare controversies, uh, that goes back to 1992. What was it like when the panel, say even the brawly comment on Sean Kavanagh is always mm. mentioned as well. What was it like on the panel where you thought to yourself as presenter, oh, that's gone a bit far, but it's been said, what do I do here? That's not comfortable. No, it's not. Uh, and it, it happened famously uh, on one occasion with Joe Brawley and a comment that he made about a colleague of, of ours. Um, but Martin Morrissey, which yes. he, in fairness, he says, and, and Brawley is on the record as saying, in fairness, look, I've, I've said a lot of things. The one thing I'm really apologetic yeah. over is that one. And, but I think everyone can understand. We've all made a joke where we're like, oh, crap, that wasn't that funny. Yeah, I that mean, happens. knowing knowing Joe, obviously, a very, very intelligent man, obviously, yeah. but sometimes he would, he would say things without thinking it out in his own head, which you have to do. You have to kind of just briefly run this through yourself and say, is this OK? Like, am I, am I just, you know about to say the wrong thing here yeah. or in the wrong circumstances and, and OK, look, that it happened. But isn't that, that sort of the type of person that we all want to watch on television? Well, it got isn't, a bit isn't, too... Isn't this the... It, didn't it get a bit cartoonish for a while? I, I used to get annoyed. I was like, Dunphy, Hook, Brawley, it's, it's too much. Like, they're not analysing the game and I want a bit more of that. But you have to be careful what you wish for because once they go yeah. away and you don't have them anymore and you have this ultra analysis, it's kind of boring. You know what I mean? At half yeah, time, I mean, you want to... Like in Crow Park, when we used to cover, when I used to cover matches there, at half time we'd all rush in to see of how course. to see how you were herding cats on TV yeah. at half time, you know, <laughs> to see how it's going, like you know, because yeah. it was just pure fun. Yeah, I would often cases, particularly with Joe, I would get a sense of where he was about to go with something, sure, because he would obviously we're chatting amongst ourselves apart from what has been said on air and that kind of thing, and and once or twice with Joe getting the vibe off him as to where his head was was working. I used to. I, I said to him one day, Joe. I said, if you even attempt to say that, I'm going to break your effing nose. And it's as simple as that. I said. And you got to give us which, which one that was. And did you break his nose when he said it? <laughs> he wasn't quite sure whether I was serious or not, but he decided not to take the chance. And, you know, one of my, that piece that I mentioned there about Sean McGoldrick in the uh, yeah. in the Sunday World, uh, one of my favourite bits in it, which um, uh, Sean mentions there in the paper, was back in the mid '90s, sometime. There was a very fractious Ulster Championship match between Armagh and Donegal. And Pat, on the programme, this was the nighttime programme, we had no live game at the time, uh, described it as thuggery. Yeah. And the manure hit the fan big time. Everybody in Ireland wanted to sue us and everybody was going to get fired and everything was going to happen and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> so much so that the following week on the Sunday game, even though it was a hurling Sunday, the head of sport at the time, Tim O'Connor, insisted that Pat come up from Temple No and apologise for what he'd said. Right. And Pat didn't want to do this. He was standing over his remarks, and that was it. And he wasn't going to have to come to be brought on television to apologise for his remarks. But eventually, Tim said, this will be our last gig if you don't do it, kind of, you know. Yeah. Um, so Pat comes on, and I broached the topic with him, and you made comments last week that's caused a lot of controversy. And I did, I did, I did, I did. I said, <laughs> I, I mentioned the word thuggery, and I, you know the way sometimes you just say things. But look, at, let's be honest with ourselves here. There was criminal acts before on this <laughs> And I'm going, oh, please. When, when we finished the programme, Tim, the late Tim O'Connor, was on the phone for me out in the control room. And the... And, he was incoherent. I couldn't... Un the only two words I understood was, you're fired. <laughs> what uh, cripes. Yeah. Ah, that's good. Gav, you were making the point that people bemoaned the Hook, Dunphy, Bro Joe Brawley-esque style of pundit and be careful what you wish for. Wish for. Yeah, I, I, as I was saying, it, was, it used to drive me nuts by the end because I just wanted analysis. I wanted ex-players or play, people with a cutting edge coaches to tell me a couple of things that I don't understand, you know, when, when it comes to them. But then when that happens... 
that only takes a couple of seconds. You really do. What you really want is a row, like, you know, or a little bit, or de- a good, solid, strong debate, you know. Yeah. Um, and that means people have to be very, very comfortable on camera, and also they have to be, <laughs> they have to have a certain character, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's a fine balance, I, I think, and uh, it's, it's very difficult to find. Like, yeah. I don't think we're ever going to find anyone like uh, Brawley or Dunphy again, you know, who have gravitas and these <laughs> larger than life characters, you know, yeah. who can actually write as well. They, they, they did all three, they do all three. So it's very hard to find those kind of per- people, but they are out there, they do exist, so, you know. And do you think sensibilities have I'm not changed? not sure we're looking for them, actually, by the way, is what I'm well, saying. Well, I mean, yes. I mean, they've got to be out there, but uh, have sensibilities changed amongst the audience now? Do you, like, do you think, Michael, things that were said 10, 15 years ago now would just be frowned upon by the public en masse, or could we still take a bit of the boys at their most vicious? We could, I think we could still take it, but I, but I see where the issues are, because back in the day, RTE used to be, quite simply, at times, defiant of Croke Park about things. Croke Park wanted to do a contract renewal years ago on the basis that Spillane was taken off the programme. What? Mm-hmm. And, and obviously we said, go shoot yourselves, kind of, you know. Um, but, but I think now, because sport has changed and sport and media has changed, and the kind of money that somebody like RT or whoever it may be is paying or Virgin Media and that for, you know, GEA rights or rugby rights or whatever the case is, it's, it's almost like you're, you're too reliant on them. You know, you, you can't just now say to them, we'll cover your games, but you just, you know, suck it up and that kind of thing. It's just, there are too much in each other's pockets yes. these days. And I think that's part of the, the issue here, kind of, you know. Mm. Do you that's as far away from journalism as you can possibly get. Oh, though. sure, that's the point. Yeah, pick, uh, pick the whole panel, why don't you? You know, take everyone you want. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, which is a uh, very striking in RTE over the last decade or so, is they've gone away from the model of a set panel. And I, I heard Tommaso Shea, ironically, he was interviewing Joe Brawley recently on his podcast, and I, he, he made a point, and I was finding myself, I'm nodding in the car in yeah. total agreement, and he was saying, I love, be it the soccer with the boys or the rugby with the boys as it was, or. Uh, your trio I loved turning on knowing who I was going to see yeah. week on week and knowing oh well you said that last week now and actually this has happened so y- are you changing your tune and sure well yeah. you had that and, the dun- and then they get we very we still have it with Liam Brady and Richie Sadler just about yeah but I think we're losing it everywhere else like comfortable enough to have a row I even noticed it with the Virgin guys they're, they're far more able to have rows with each other as it's gone on because mm. there's, a, there's a trust built up and you must really have experience that whereas I think it must be quite difficult if you're in a studio with three people you don't know very well sure. to on national television say I actually think you're talking garbage there and here's why you know you're far more inclined to just sit there and say yeah uh, there, there's there are new panelists a- appearing uh, every weekend practically uh, on all these things when I started on the Sunday game first back in the 80s we had one hurling panelist which was Eamon Cregan and we had one football panelist which was Enda Collar and that was about it Mm. And you might bring in somebody else sometime during the season as a, as a special guest, if you like, you know. Whereas now it seems to be kind of a revolving carousel of, of panellists. And Andy McGinley, for example, was on yesterday. Oh, we love Andy. And he's great. Yeah. Yeah, no, Andy was very good. Yeah. But I hadn't seen him before, actually, on that setup and all yeah. that kind of thing. You know, and that, that's, that's the kind of thing I mean, that, that uh, ability to build up a rapport mm. with the guys you're working with because you, you do it so often. And, Maybe they're, and they're trying to find maybe Sean Kavanagh they're trying to build Sean Kavanagh and I don't know Gooch into long term and they just need a year or two to kind of bed in and get used to each other and they're trying to find personalities that mix and you know. maybe it's just a process but the I hope so that, like, you know. I don't think so because it's happening across the board on all of the, if it was just like oh the GAs in flux right now sports entertain, it's, it's, this is pure entertainment like like the best one is like outside the, the NBA on TNT they, they cover the, the basketball they have Charles Barkley on there and he could say absolutely anything at yeah. any stage but also then he's one of the greatest basketball players ever so you can mm. go back to him and he can he can re- reel it in and he can go right out there yeah yeah that's a hard person to find you know? it's yeah, very yeah. hard yeah and it's, it's it does take people. time and and ga by its nature i mean people don't want to offend and that's why I mean, it was, it was i'm insane. defending your tea here at the moment <laughs> it's, it, look it's really not easy it, absolutely it isn't yeah and did you feel a certain responsibility or stress or, or guilt when things were being said which were really close to the wire and because you have to constantly make judgments with a panel like that do I jump in here and stop them in full flow and go oh well Joe in fairness the other side of that is this and oh, look in the interest of balance I have to say that or do you just say this is incredible television I'm going to just shut up here and 
oh, I don't like what I don't love what he's saying, but yeah. bloody hell, no one's going to thank me for like going, oh, Joe, what about this and what about that? That is your dilemma, I felt, and yeah. especially as time went on. And it was, uh, well, it was very much lose lose the, almost. Yeah, it was it was very much the latter type of situation that you you mentioned there. In that, very often during those panel discussions, and and they would get heated at times or controversial or whatever the case is, and I was constantly getting in my ear, shut them up, move this thing on. But I knew myself, this is good. Yes. This is a bit dodgy, but it's good. <laughs> like no. the Sean Cavanagh rugby tackle, that was the stone belt. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But there was he's no not, him up he's that not a man. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can forget him about him as a man, I think, was the, yeah. was the great infamous line. Well, there was no shutting him up that way, actually. Oh, no, no. Once, once Brandy goes, he's gone. You, you might as well go and have a cup of coffee, and, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. And sorry for the poor judges up the north. Like. Yeah. And how, was, and that was tough, I'd say. Like yeah. to walk for you because like you're the only person there who can call a halt so ultimately well, this, this is this greatest thing. responsibility on you as well yeah, a huge because I mean afterwards during the week or even on the day uh, at the production meetings and all that I'd get the blame for the thing yeah. you know I didn't say anything but I'd get the blame for it anyway kind of you know but uh, anyway look that's that's the gig you're in you yeah. know that and you just have to accept it and carry but, on but it was fun and actually as a final point that's what Spillan said that period he loved well, it that, that's the way I look back on it Joe I thoroughly enjoyed it and I, I saw it all as fun and and okay, fine, there were tricky times and difficult times and there were times when I sat in the uh, head of sports office getting my ears bit off me and all that kind of stuff. But look, that's that's the game, kind of, you know, you, you just got on with it. Mm. Well, end of an era. Colm O'Rourke will be there when? Until the very end. I must give Colm a text and say, <laughs> two down, one to go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, speaking of GAA at large then, this is a huge day in the sporting calendar. It's been a huge weekend. Uh, quite a bit of the talk in the coverage has been about the fact that there hasn't been all that much talk in the media. Like Tommy Conlon, for instance, talks about it in his piece on page 12 of the Sunday Independent. So he says the war of no words, mm. as it's been, is based on fear of adding to rivals' ammunition. And He really talks about how... Uh, there's been a monastic silence and he says the customary prudence in this regard has mutated into chronic agoraphobia, it would seem, if not full-blown paranoia. Uh, the dubs, with their national media as always on the uh, on their doorstep, they've managed once again to batten down the publicity hatches while Kerry management didn't even bother with the courtesy of a briefing for their own local press. He says, on the inside of both camps, it's presumably a justifiable precaution. On the outside and this is a, a great line in some respects. He says, on the outside, though, it's coming to seem more and more like an exercise in risable self-importance. There are global superstars more accessible to cameras and microphones than the primary school teacher who plays this local sport that the rest of the world doesn't even know exists. And he says that the, the governing impulse in these teams, in this closed mouth strategy, is not indifference or humility, but fear. It is precisely because it is so local that they dare not utter a word that might be considered even vaguely antagonistic to the fellas over the county bounds. So I think Tommy sums up that culture which is in the GAA at the moment. This is nothing new, yeah, but no. it is growing. Yeah. And that's the problem here and, and becoming more difficult. Um, I remember years ago, at the start of a Grand Prix, Michael Schumacher has just got into his car, into the Ferrari, and Martin Brundle was coming down the pit lane doing the interviews and all that, and he kind of looked at Schumacher and more or less kind of said, am I too late? Schumacher got back out of the car again and had a few words with them. And you see it yourself, you're looking at Grand Prix, like 15 minutes before the Grand Prix, you can see drivers having chats with media and all that kind of stuff. Can you see Demi Lawler getting into the dubs changing room that's now the in the next that's, half That's an hour. exactly what I'm saying. I was, I was watching some years back uh, a soccer match in Argentina, and there was a hold up for an injury. And while the injury was being treated, the sideline reporter goes on and he has a word with the full back on the estate <laughs> who went to the team or something like that, who was totally comfortable with it. He wasn't taken by surprise or anything like that. It was obviously just part of their culture, you know. It's, yeah, said American well, football and, and, and yeah. all sports in America. Yeah. Um, and all the moaning about it, like, again, Tommy's piece, is, there's a bit of balance in it, but my attitude, again, this was a problem 15 years ago, I remember. and. I remember it's the exact same thing I say then I say now was either put up or shut up. If you've got an issue, you have you have a bit of power and that's coverage. The media, the GA media has coverage. So if mm. you, that's your only tool, that's your only chip, that's your only weapon. So if you want to do something about the, the blackout of coverage, you shut down their sponsors. You shut the, you know, that is your weapon, you know what I mean? You, you don't play ball the way that you're supposed to play ball. There's a bunch of sponsorship gigs. You don't, you don't turn up at them. And you, 
c- cobbled together and you work together. The football uh, reporters have done it. Uh, Ruby lads less so. But like, there is a way you do have like if Desi Farrell is turned around and not, he refuses to give a simple answer about is it what Conor Callaghan or James McCarthy's uh, injuries are. If it's like yeah. a flat like. And Desi Fraud is a good man, and he's you know he he actually is quite good in the media over the years from his GPA stuff. But like he, he was blatantly like, I'm not even going to tell you, like what part of the body it is, what leg it is, or anything like that. Okay, if that's the way you're going to play ball, here's how we're going to cover it. What are your sponsors? Oh, we can't remember their names, the pictures and all that. That is your only weapon. Otherwise, you have to just suck it up and get on with it. That's yeah, yeah. that's my take on it. You either get militant about it if it's such a big problem and if it's affecting your jobs. Or you don't, or you get in line and go and see where they go with it, you know? There's I don't think the GEA centrally can control this, is what I'm saying. No, and, and as I said a, a moment ago, there's, there's nothing actually new about this because I remember years ago doing a press night down the country, and I won't say what county it was because they're pretty much all the same in it, and the idea was that the, the team would be available to the media after they had a light training session and that, but and it was supposed to be in this particular hotel in the town. And guess what? The team were allowed to go home. All the media showed up and nobody else showed up. They just went home. Yeah. I mean, people have travelled like from over from Dublin or up from Cork or whatever the Kerry and blah blah blah. And and it was just like it was just so naff kind of, you know, that sort of But Kenny Press used almost. to be great because they fed us steaks and Langtons. Yeah. So that was I would, I never didn't care who they got, like who we got like the interview because they gave us a big slap up meal. But and what, you knew you'd get Cody at the end of it. What about the anyway, argument you know? though that as amateurs they're absolutely under no obligation to put themselves forward to the media? Okay, well, what about the, sp- the, m- the money that's been pumped into them? Mm. That's like their sponsors are... That's You could argue the sponsors are paying for the right to be on the front of the jersey and that's it. They're not paying to have the cornerback talk to the media. Okay. Well, but then, I, I don't, think, I think don't is, put them in our media. Yeah, but I think the, don't, the, have to, don't, the, show, don't make them visible. Make them invisible. And then we'll see what happens. That's the, never been done the, properly. The situation is, it's, it's, not, it's not actually been driven by the players. It's been driven by... The management. The very the well team, compensated that, managers so. as well. Yes, yeah. Correct and right, yes. For, yeah. for fear of saying something that is up in the opposition dressing room. Yeah, but I mean, look at, you know, if you're, if you're that paranoid about things. It's pure yeah, paranoia at this stage. Uh, you know. I, yeah. I feel, yeah. I feel it's pure paranoia. Like, uh, Jim Gavin, but well, Jim Gavin looked at his team as a platoon, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, so I've never heard of, like, any uh, generals in war go, talking at, at length to the media. That was the way Jim operated it. So it was always, like, yeah. a closed, a sealed box. You know? And you know the way it's been... So, yeah, if, again, it's mentioned even in Mark O'Shea's piece. He says, it's been the strangest of build-ups to a game that should have held the nation's interest all week. There was a time when Kerry Meat and Dublin High Summer would consume our thoughts and conversation, but for much of the week, not a peep about it. And he's again talking about the. This is Marco Shea, though. You remember his Kerry team? Oh, sure. He's talking about <laughs> he's the gas thing. He's like. talking about the lack of uh, contributions from players. I'm, I've, met, I've met loads of top uh, Irish sports people when they were 18, 19, and then you don't see them again until they're 32, 33. Sure. Yeah, like, they come out of hibernation. Well, because there's a column in the, up there for them, you know what I mean? Okay, well, maybe there's that too, and I don't want to uh, walk all over my, my autobiography, which is going to be out when I'm 35 as well. But I was going to make the point, like, so. I don't remember really anything Jim Gavin ever said uh, 10 days before a match being used to spark interest. Like, uh, these media days, as they were, they seem to have stopped now, but it was like the manager saying nothing and probably two subs saying Mm -hmm. nothing. So I actually think there must be another reason why Kerry Dublin and this weekend hasn't caught the imagination. I, I, like, I don't think it's the morsels that Jim Gavin were giving us, was giving us a few years ago that sparked the but, buzz. But there's no Just, interest, there's no build-up. Why is, who's, one, two of one, Dublin one, and Kerry played since the league that, that's captured the imagination to, of either team, you know? There's just nothing. So there's nothing to kind of... Cork's not pulling yes. anyone in. I mean, I'm talking like the, the people who are going to their first match of the season in Crow Park today, you know, that's those people like Dave. Yeah, but I, I personally haven't got my head around this this early championship idea, um, considering that we have the All Ireland hurling final next weekend yeah, yeah. in pretty much the middle of July. I mean, I just haven't kind of worked that out in my head just yet, kind of, you know, or or that we'll come to, to August and have nothing, kind of, you know, so maybe that's a, a factor in it. Maybe we're just not all settled into it just yet. Mm. And by the time we are settled into it, it's going to be over. I know. So. I, I do feel like I'm just getting into it. <laughs> <A> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. A exactly. bit, all right. Yeah, 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 I do have that sense as well. But again, it has been quiet this week. If ever there was a game that would have got people going, I don't know. It just hasn't seemed to for whatever reason. Like I was even listening to our lunchtime live show and turned it on randomly, and Andrea Gilligan had uh, John Duggan in studio and Philly McMahon on the phone, and even they were talking about just the lack of, 
I kind of buzz, crack, build up, whatever phrase you want to use. Sure, the, yeah. But uh, interesting, the, the four semi finalists yeah. this weekend are all the four provincial winners. So it's not kind of lack of quality or anything like that. Mm. Uh, an actual fact in Croker yesterday, the Tolchin Cup was probably better than the, the senior game between uh, the ending, Colby and Derry. Yeah. And, and the significance of it, for obviously, from Westmead point of view and winning a trophy and uh, the significance of it going forward in terms of the All Ireland Championship next year and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Also, Kimmage, I thought, nailed it when he was off. He was playing golf with Paul Mannion there a while ago. He wrote about it a couple of weeks back. Yeah. And uh, he man's a glittering Dublin football career. Uh, unbelievable player with a great story. Went to China for a year, everything. It's never really been told. And his, and his integrated career is over. And Kimmage just pointed it out going, yeah, we're... You, oh, we know each other. He was like, we don't know each other. We never met. Like, <laughs> this is our first real meeting. You know, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's too late now. You know, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. So, I always felt that about this because I was in the midst of reporting on on the, that great Kilkenny team, and I, mem- I remember just thinking, going, we're not going to get to know these lads. But thankfully, we do get to know them on off the ball now and in newspaper articles. Yeah. Like, like who'd have guessed? Yeah. Tommy Walsh was like Tommy, Tommy Walsh. Walsh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Jackie Tyrrell is, is great. Is yeah. Quality, Jackie, exactly, quality yeah. value. Yeah. And, and you could you could see it. You knew what their personality was like, but you were never getting it anywhere near. Uh, so maybe it. this is all like this is as you said. It's nothing new. Maybe it's just the talking point for this week. It's bubbled up and it'll go away again. I don't know if it's undermining the interest in the game come half three today. I'd say the audience will still be absolutely massive. Well, of course they will. Yeah. Um, it's it's more I mean I guess we're looking at this naturally from a media point of view yeah and and how it's affecting us I suppose more than how it's affecting the public okay well, this small violin Nick Foley got, got his job done though today in the Sunday Times yeah he went about it a different way yeah and Getch it was Shawnee O'Shea was yeah it? the Kerry he captain get him so he went and got everyone else around him which is always better like you know great idea yeah your teachers talking about Sean O'Shea as a young fella being the first eight year old he ever saw do a full diving block and th- those kind of little nuggets mm. around a player it's another way to do it it was good yeah. I remember years ago, we were down doing a preview for a football semi-final when Paddy, Paddy O'Shea, was manager of Kerry. And we knew the form with Paddy. Uh, he would tell you that, you know what, whatever you want to do, no problem at all, kind of, and then would stop everything that you tried to do. Kind yeah, of, you know? yeah. But we wanted to do an interview with Daryl Kaneda, who was on the team at that time. But we knew Paddy was going to, to try and stop it. But we, we got around Dara to do it because he works for Radio Nile Gael and obviously a sister station to RTE and all that kind of stuff. But we couldn't tell Paddy. And Paddy rang me during the day. I'd arranged to meet him later in the evening. And he rang me to say he had a small bit of a problem that it might be a little bit late, blah, 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 the usual kind of thing. And I said uh, to him, but look what I said, if, if it's any good to you, Paddy, I says, we can meet you out in Ventry because we might be around that area mm. and all that kind of thing. What are you doing out in Fentry? And I said, ah, you know, nice Kerry scenery, shouldn't, wouldn't it be a shame to come down here and not look at some of the scenery? <laughs> so he rang me about an hour later. You in Fentry yet? And I said, no, we're not actually, no. Um, uh, you meeting anybody? I said, no, not really, no. No major plans, which is a complete lie, of course, you know. <laughs> and then later in the evening, I met him in Killarney at, as per arranged, and, met him in this hotel and uh, got chatting and I said, uh, yeah, I said, we're out in your neck of the woods. I said, did a nice piece actually with Daryl Kennedy out out there. And he he kind of, he froze for about 10 seconds and then he said, have you ever eaten in this hotel? And I said, no, I haven't. He says, "Mm, nice food. And that was the end of it. He was done. We got the better of him. There was no point in saying any more. So... Uh, if uh, we could go through time or some uh, parallel universe, mm. if uh, you're on the TV with Joe Brawley talking about yesterday's game, in his piece here I have a sense of what he would have said to you. Yes. And it's in his closing line. I'm glad we're not in the final, he said oh. at Derry. Galway were not bad, Derry were out of their depth. More than that, our style of play bespoils the ancient game and I'm glad we're not in the final, uh, said Joe Brawley. What did you make of yesterday's game? Did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it because Galway won. Let's be honest with ourselves here. As simple as that. And and I, I liked the way Galway set up uh, in terms of their tactics and their management of the game and so on. Everybody in the West obviously wants Galway to play this kind of daring do, swashbuckling kind of football. And Parry Joyce has gone about it in a different way this year. He's, he's playing to measure in terms of what the opposition are like. I mean, Galway didn't score for 20 minutes in that game yesterday. But they knew what they were at, or at least they had a, they had a game plan mm. and they had it worked out and eventually ground Derry down and 
OK, fine. Derry made it life a bit difficult for themselves and some of their own tactics and that kind of stuff. Look, it wasn't a great game of football. It, for the purest or the neutral, no, I wouldn't have enjoyed it. But then, having said that, mm. I'm really punching the television by the end of it, especially when Damien Comper scored the second goal, kind of, you know. So, yeah, look. Derry were so drilled, weren't they? They didn't know what to do when they, they, need, when they were four, three, four points behind. First time they've been behind all yeah. year as well. Yeah. Very similar to Donegal 2011, 2012, if they keep going, you know. Yeah. Well, Brawley says you, Derry discovered in the second half you can't defend your way to an All Ireland. Uh, he also makes the point, I don't know what your thoughts are on, on this, Gav. The modern idea of one goalkeeper as a magician who attacks freely, contests the opposing team's kickouts, and is an accomplished all round footballer is being exposed for the dangerous fallacy that it is. Well, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no question, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yesterday, looking at it, I mean, what, what happened to the goalkeeper, Oran Lynch, was, was always going to happen. I mean, it was like that he was playing with a pin and a grenade for the second half, kind of, because he spent most of his time. There's a picture, actually, I think, in the. Oh, that's the picture there, in fact, in the Sunday Independent today. Yeah. Of, there are two players in the shot. This is when Damien Comer scores the goal. What a finish, the, by the way. Yeah? What a finish, by the way. Oh, yeah. I mean, fair. I thought he took such a belt at it. I thought he was going to send it wide, mm. uh, but obviously didn't. Uh, no sign of the goalkeeper. No sign of any of the defenders except one Dowie defender. And you're thinking to yourself, like, who made this, who made this decision up? Like, who, what's, what's the team plan here? And if you know, anyway. Are you going, will you be coming up then in a couple of weeks uh, thinking you'll do it to Mayo again, go win and sneak a few All-Irelands after all their misery? Or do well, you, you, know, are, I, you I be was, very, very, very worried about... I was, I was talking to John O'Mahony actually yesterday about that possible scenario and, and comparing it uh, to when Galway won the All-Ireland in 1998 and Mayo had lost the two previous All-Irelands and saying, do you know what, there's a, there's a certain similarity going on here. And in fact, Galway beat Derry in the semi-final in 1998 on their That's way right. to the final. <laughs> And uh, and who knows? I mean, I think that the, the the money will be on the other side of the draw. Whoever wins between Dublin and yeah. Kerry today, will, mm, excuse me, will have to be the favourites. But I certainly would not rule Galway out of the picture because Galway are inclined to get better the closer they've gotten to Croke Park down through the years, you know. And uh, and as I said, I liked I didn't like the football, but I liked their game plan yesterday. So yeah, on the goalkeeper point, like I'm not against innovation at all, and we should celebrate when it's good and. Definitely when a team are attacking at pace and a goalkeeper is providing an overlap or, you know, an injection of something, I think that's like there's something to be said for that. But when it's like a stagnant pool with numbers everywhere and you're just another body floating around and Damien Comer is waiting. I know. And Galway were in the habit of turnovers. Like, you know, they had quite a few turnovers and the crowd would go wild. Can they get it up to Comer? It was like this period of the game where it was waiting to happen. I just can't see what the logic of having yet another body in that very congested area just hanging around is. That was the curious thing. But, but that's, that's what I said to you a moment ago. It was almost like a disaster waiting to happen. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. yeah, And it happened. You wanted, what, what did you... You said Bradley was saying something? Oh, yeah, just on that line. His, 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 one really good line on... Uh, uh, Galway began hesitantly unsure of what to expect from this unknown Derry team. Even in Derry, little, is, little or nothing is known of them. They work in secret with Rory Gallagher behind closed doors and might as well be CIA agents for all they reveal. Mm. <laughs> so just back to what we were saying. Yeah. Uh, there is a piece that Paul Rowan has written which catches the eye. What have you given us, Robbie, is mm. the headline and it's a picture of Robbie Keane and the byline is Keane's lucrative FAI contract ends with many fans questioning value for money. So he starts off by saying, in the wider world, Robbie Keane, popular and respected as ever. And, and on his recent anniversary on Instagram, he and his wife exchanged uh, messages and uh, footballing A-listers such as David Beckham, Figo, Michael Owen, Patrick Cliver chipped in with affectionate greetings of their own. He's done work for Sky Sports and UEFA recently. Last month managed a charity World Eleven, photographed at the Irish Open playing with James Nesbitt. But what about the day job? asked Paul Rowan. Keane's near four-year contract as Ireland assistant coach comes to an end this month. The FAI refused to confirm or deny exactly when Keane is leaving or whether in fact he had already left with Keane's agent silent also. So we don't quite know uh, the situation. The last thing either side wants, says Paul Rowan, is to pump this particular ball with any more oxygen. Uh, Paul Rowan says, judging by social media outpourings, many Irish footballer fa- supporters largely blame Keane for a situation which he has been, in which he has been an onlooker like everybody else since Stephen Kenny took over in April 2020, except that he has been on an FAI salary of around €250,000 a year, is the uh, general reporting. And uh, Paul Rowan mentions the Fine Gael Senator Michael Carragy, who had to 
apologise for comments he made about uh, the situation very recently. And what Paul Rowan does in this piece really is just chart the general history of this agreement, which of course was at a curious time to say the least in the FAI's history. John Delaney uh, told an FAI board of management that he had met Keane, this was in 2018, and that he saw him assisting in the management of the team with Mick McCarthy, eventually becoming manager. And uh, McCarthy then revealed that Keane had approached him at an event at the K Club in September 18 and asked him for a coaching role in a future Ireland setup. Uh, cheeky bollocks, said McCarthy uh, in a press conference, but he still took Keane on. Rowan says there were other curious details. Keane was third in command, but he was getting paid more than McCarthy's first assistant, Terry Connor, who himself was on a large salary of €200,000. And Keane's contract was for four years, whereas McCarthy and Connor were only given two before uh, the handing over to Stephen Kenny. The association's records back in 2019 show Keane was paid 150000 for the first year, then 250000 for each of the next two years before he was due to get an increase which would see him net 200000 from December 2021 to the end of this month when his contract expired. And uh, on we've gone, really. Uh, Paul Rowan certainly mentions that when it became apparent Stephen Kenny didn't want... Robbie Keane as part of his setup. Niall Quinn spoke to Keane eventually and was left in no doubt about how badly Robbie Keane felt he'd been treated. Claudine Keane took to social media to complain that her husband, says Paul Rowan, was learning about events through the news and she added pointedly, respect is everything. And uh, as a final point, Paul Rowan says the FAI's reticence on contractual matters would be more understandable were it not for the fact that the taxpayer has been propping up the association since wholesale financial mismanagement led it towards insolvency before uh, Delaney stepped aside. And uh, he mentions as a very final point in his piece, Keane was 42 on Friday and there were hearty emojis exchanged online between the FAI and Keane. However, a lengthy thaw will be needed. And so uh, there we are, Gav. This has been much commented on since Stephen Kenny took over and it became apparent that Robbie Keane was not involved in the setup. Uh, he has had a contract. He's been perfectly entitled to um, see that contract out, and he has. And as Paul Rowan says, proportion of supporters, it's hard to put a number on it in percentage terms, but I've uh, uh, raised eyebrows and, and wondered um, about the fact that there was so much money being paid to Robbie Keane, and in effect, he wasn't part of the coaching staff. So it's it's yet another legacy of that era of the FAI, which really is um, tawdry, to say the least. Well, the contract was signed, I think, post Delaney, but um, as far as I know, listen to what Jonathan Hill said, and it was the only just tiny thing he would say about it, because he said, I do not want to be quoted about Robbie Keane anymore. I have an agreement with Robbie on that. Yes. But he did say the contract is up now, this month. Mm -hmm. So yeah. he said that a couple of months back. Um, yeah, it's been a very difficult situation because it's not Robbie Keane's fault. And I believe um, there was some mention that he's tried to work with underage teams in there, a la John O'Shea and his work with the under-21s. I think he's doing work with Shamrock Rovers under-15s. And then he did that big Sky Sports All About Him uh, show there a couple of months back where he talked about his real, his real desire to get into management as a number one, if not, you know, because he's not, he's not the, the coach coach that Kenny was looking for anyway. You know, um, he initially went with Duff and then Barry and now Eustace, who's gone again. So Kenny's back looking for another uh, trainer. Um, and so it was a situation where Kenny had a contract, Robbie had a contract, and the manager gets to... He wanted to it's stipulated in Kenny's contract that he gets to pick his own backroom team, which is the only way you can have it, you know yeah. what I mean? It's so like, yeah. for us to kind of read between the lines and put any difficulties with... Put it on Robbie Keane would be ridiculous or to put it on Kenny would be ridiculous and it's, it's not even the, the current FAI's fault either you know mm. it's a brand new new broom in there it's an unseemly situation and it ha it's, it's no one's no one's fault and it's over now yeah it's it's interesting and it's a little bit like the scenario at Manchester United when Eric Ten Hag came in and United had done this deal with Ralph Ranick uh, the caretaker manager last season, that he would have this consultancy role going forward and all that thing. And the first thing that Ten Hag said and he went in is, you can you can write whatever you like, in it, but he's not working with me. And that's yeah. the end of that, kind of, you know? Yeah. And good luck. Yeah. It was messy, that was, yeah. Because Keane has been criticised for this situation in several quarters. People have said, well, you know... Should, for and the he good has strongly of, defended himself, which he's every Irish, right to do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look, he's given a contract, I understand that. And people have said, for the good of Irish football and everything else, should you just... 
well, yeah, I, I relinquish suppose the contract. The thing is, but Joe, it's, it's a little bit of a situation with the FAI that the AI, IABA are now finding themselves in where they're being told, listen, guys, you, you need to sort yourselves out here, kind of, you know, yeah. and put things right. So there's a challenge there. No, there uh, is. For those organisations. For a lot of the last couple of years since Kenny took over, a routine question for FAI officials was, is there any movement on the Robbie Keane contract situation? To which they would always say, we're working on it and hopefully a solution will be here in the short term. Mm. And actually, it turns out they've been saying that for, in effect, yeah, yeah. two years yeah. and we've just reached yeah. the natural conclusion of the contract. So I guess they won't be asked about it anymore. But that's Paul Rowan, who, in fairness, always goes for these um, important subjects. He got his four no comments. That's all you can do as a reporter, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And he no got comment, no comment, no comment. <laughs> hey, can I ask your thoughts on... Uh, this piece. I was just uh, curious what you think. This is in the Sunday Times where Nick Fowler used to write a column and actually that's mentioned by Nick Greenslade that his column maybe in some ways really helped his reputation and, and uh, possibly uh, allowed him to become Ryder Cup captain which I'd slightly query. I think the six time major winner uh, from Europe who was a Ryder Cup legend was always likely to be Ryder Cup captain but that notwithstanding uh, it's basically Faldo new chapter awaits and there are two pictures of uh, Faldo with his uh, new wife. I guess the jumping off point is that he's resigned or, or he's uh, retiring from CBS, which is like the chair in American golf mm -hmm. broadcasting. You know, it's like Johnny Miller and then Ken Venturi and now Faldo. It's, it's like Brawley going for tea. Yeah. It's big. It's, it's incredibly lucrative. It's like you're the guy, basically. You're the main man or woman calling the golf man as it's been in the, over the decades on CBS every Sunday and at the major. So it's, it's, it's the one and he's probably paid, um, you know, uh, millions and millions, ten million plus, whatever for the for the role. But so it, it starts off. He's he's gone from CBS, and then it says, "Well, what's he going to be up to now?" And it just goes into, I don't know. I, I was reading this, going, "Oh, is this all necessary?" So it starts off by saying he's recently been married to Lindsay DeMarco, twenty twenty one. Lindsay is former topless dancer who's already been married six times and also has a drug conviction. It says, and then it has a quote from Faldo about his. Their move to Montana, where they plan to live a fairly uh, relaxed life. You wish them well, says the piece, but the omens are not exactly promising. Faldo married Melanie Rockwell in 1979, although the marriage ended in '84. He began seeing Jill Bennett, who was working for his managing co company. Has a quote from Faldo about the relationship. They spent, they had three children together. Then that marriage disintegrated in 1995. His affair with a 19-year-old American student, uh, Brenna Seaplack. That romance ended three years later when he met Valerie Bircher at a tournament in Switzerland. Selipak took revenge by taking a golf club to her lover's Porsche, causing 10,000 of damage. The Bircher Faldo marriage produced a daughter, Emma, but only lasted five years. It would be another 15 years until he dipped his toe back in, etc., etc. Yeah. It's kind of thinking, is this like fair game? And as a reader, that's, that's, like I'm, get, I'm getting. Are they pulling that insight. from his autobiography or something? Or? They don't say where they're pulling it from. I guess it's probably fairly public knowledge, but I, I couldn't work out if. As a reader in the privacy of our own homes, this is exactly what we want from our journalism to, to give us an insight behind the curtain. Or does this across well, a line? Too, too much of that article on that kind of situation. It's, it's personal stuff that really has nothing to do with the big picture of, of where Faldo is at at the moment in his career and life and so on. <clears throat> but then I suppose we have to take into account here that Nick has had a very strained relationship with the media down through his career. Mm. And do you remember the time Gavin that famously said after winning some tournament a couple of years ago um, one of the, the majors the actually, Open I think yeah uh, yeah. he said I'd like to thank the media from the heart of my bottom as you know so yeah and, and that kind of summed up the the, the that scenario that came as you go to that column with him for years and it was a really really for a good fascinating while, yeah. Good, yeah. really good combination if you know what I mean yeah well I'd say yeah, if you're writing about, if I'm writing about someone's relationship from the 80s, 70s into the 80s and the, f the fact that they have had a child and with other someone else and then a teenager was involved, I'm not a sports writer anymore. I'm, mm. I'm something entirely different. Yeah, it just That's, yeah jumped yeah. off into a, an odd, an unexpected area, I thought. Anyway, maybe it's just us. Um, maybe in the privacy of our homes is exactly what we want to be well, I mean, reading that, away, beaver in away yeah, reading. But that, that article is, as, as you guys said... It's not the higher moral the, ground where we exist, Joe. It's in the sports pages of the paper, yeah. you know. It's not in the gossip section of it. It's in the yeah. sports pages. And does it have a place there? I don't believe it does. Mm. But anyway, there you go. Uh, what's what's this one, one editor said? Rule number one, don't be boring. I guess it's not boring is the, <laughs> the other side of the argument. As you said, I'm not on the high moral ground either. I read it and I'm sure um, lots did. Yeah. Uh, before we go, Gav, you wanted to... There were pieces on the J.P. McManus Pro-Am extravaganza that was that you had uh, picked out and thought were of interest. Yeah, um... There's no, 
the Sunday Times and the Mail address it. It was just a, so I actually was watching it with, with my parents uh, during the week, and my mom, my mother turned around and went, "What? What is this?" <laughs> <laughs> like she was absolutely thought it was great. And she actually gave me the story that Colm Cole published about how the wives of the players had ten grand vouchers, but you can only spend only in a dare. In a dare, yeah. can't go into Limerick City now with yeah, these vouchers; yeah. they're useless, you know. Yeah. And uh, it is, it is. What's it wasn't. Sport? It's not sport. It's entertainment. What, what did you tell her when she asked what it is? I'm not sure what it was. Uh, I can't. I don't think. I think we need to edit this. Right, okay, okay, okay. If okay. I've, because it was all like what rumors I've had. I passed them off as fact. Okay. But the, the Shane McGrath writes a couple of pars on it. Doesn't make a big deal about it. He's writing more about live golf. But he writes the charity benefits of the JP McManus Pro Am are incontestable. Fifty million or something, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but what happened in a dare shouldn't be confused with sport. This was a celebrity event, and while the focus on Tiger Woods was inevitable, he is one of the most famous, important sports stars in the world. This was about influence, wealth, and power. And he said oh. some of the reporting was 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 similar to what you do at the royal wedding, which. That's not fair. I don't think you lads, you lads gave it a good. I thought it was very entertaining. Uh, like Owen oh, Sheen interviewing Alan Hansen and all that. Like I thought that was good stuff. Like you know, right? It's good. Um, so that was a bit harsh, but I presume it didn't mean you got lads. Well, I think that. It, it's it's a, a mainstream media extravaganza. I mean, it's it's exactly Bill That's Murray. Exactly are you enjoying your time yeah. in Ireland? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, kind of vibe, isn't it? Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Henry and, McKean and got a six-second interview with Tiger Woods, which I thought was funny. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, 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 in the Sunday Times, they wrote a bit more about uh, JP being a tax exile and the difference between paying your taxes and not having control of the multi-millions he invests. And he is, for every time, if you're going to be critical of JP McManus in any shape or form, you have to look at what he's done for Limer Curling. Uh, that changed my mind on these kind of things. Like, whether as, as Shane Lowry said in one of the interviews, oh, yeah, how did yeah, that thing yeah. done in, in Adair? He said... Uh, I wish JP McManus was born in Offaly, that's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, it's Colin Coyle. It's not actually in the sports section, it's, it's on the website and in the news section. It's JP McManus is an Irish hero, hyphen, for just 183 days a year. Uh, the billionaire spends most of his time in Switzerland, so he does not have to pay tax in Ireland. And it starts with an anecdote of how JP McManus helped out Shane Filan of West Life mm. a number of years ago on the quiet, and it was only because the Sunday. Times checked the land registry that they had that story, and so it's 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 positioned as an example of the generosity that JP McManus is, I think, synonymous with both very publicly and quietly as well. He hired six hundred people then in that whole area of the world, are employed by him via various exactly. the Stud Farm and Adair Manor and yeah. whatnot. And then the piece says others, though, take a more jaundiced view of the racehorse owners. Munificence. It's a great word, isn't it? Munificence. Uh, yes, so yeah. he qu- quotes... Uh, five points. <laughs> Michael, Mc- Michael McDowell, uh, former justice minister, said in 2017 he had pushed for the introduction of a levy on Ireland's tex- tex- exi- tex- tax exiles Excuse me, while in office. And he said the constitution says that fidelity to the nation and loyalty to the state are fundamental political duties of all citizens. That was McDowell in 2017. Um, McManus has addressed this, although not in any great detail. It seems in 2011 he was asked at a University of Limerick event, writes this, uh, Colin Coyle includes that in the piece, where he was asked about his um, tax status and he said, I didn't leave the country in order to avoid paying a tax or to avoid paying a future tax that was about to come down the line. I paid my taxes, I set up a business abroad. If I was somebody who set up a business abroad and it didn't go so well, I'd be considered an emigrant. If it goes well, I'm considered an exile. Do you want me to come back and try and support the local economy, try to earn some money abroad and then put it into the local economy? That's what I like to do. And the piece mentions Willie O'Dea, for instance, um, has written to similar effect that J.P. McManus gives so much back, employs 600 uh, staff at Adair Manor, etc. So why single out an Irish person who's built up a thriving business abroad for spending and investing some of that money? Here is the uh, Willie O'Dea line. Interestingly, uh, the piece goes to uh, Simon Chadwick, who lectures in France, and uh, he says, it, you know, could this be deemed sports washing? You know, this, the the investment in in sport, and he says potentially it's effectively a diversionary tactic. Don't look at this stuff about my tax affairs. Look over here, and exile on the Dare Main Street. That's the yeah. headline. And it, you know, the piece points out, unlike McManus, Michael O'Leary is a tax resident in Ireland. His annual tax bill once put it fourteen million meaning his tax returns would match the 190 million euro raised by McManus's Pro-Am in about 14 years. Uh, unlike the Limerick man, though, he doesn't get to choose where the money is spent. So that's Colin, Colin Coyle in the uh, yeah, Sunday that's Times. That's fair enough. We're, 
we're framing Michael Leary, oh, Leary as the good guy here in to JP. <laughs> this is not not non the tax exile. Yeah, I don't know. You I, know? I think there's a variety of opinion. I think it's definitely sure. worth scratching the surface when we look at this thing, this extravaganza that's down in a day every year, and it's on. Like I was shocked it was on live on Sky Sports. Oh, with the full treatment. Yeah, it really yeah, yeah. was. Yeah, you know? all their staff were there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, yeah, it was, it was so interesting. I always my philosophy about all those kind of things is. JP McManus does not owe me any money. After that, I really don't care what he does with his money. I was actually just listening the other day to a favourite album uh, from the past, the Beatles' Revolver album. Yep. And the opening track on Revolver is Taxman, in which they're having a cut at 19 for you and one for me. And some things just never change. Look, you know, I didn't see you going that way, Michael, but it's an interesting uh, <laughs> point nonetheless. In actual fact, around that time, the Rolling Stones, Mick Jagger a bit maybe more... Uh, um, cuter, let's say, about this kind of they thing. They became French, didn't they? Correct. Yeah. 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 They did. Yeah. They said, I'll tell you what, we, we won't pay that kind of money in this country. We leave the country. Right? Yeah. I see. I, there's, there's no question that it's absolutely his prerogative to do what he wants with his business affairs, and there's nothing illegal happening here whatsoever. Everything is totally above board. 100%. I, I, I mean, uh, look, look, at all I, the other, I, look at all the other big names that have their tax affairs outside Ireland. You too, for example, uh, who are based in Amsterdam. And etc. So look at I mean that's that's it. You know, yeah, I suppose your life and the the um, the quibbling I think is that there's all my, well, my sense this week is like he has an exalted status. You know, like that he's very central to Irish life. He's there at the GA matches. This pro am is you know at a very central place in the Republic. And actually, if you're going to be a central part of the Republic, that actually you should pay your taxes here. That would be the other argument. I mean, as for the sports washing point, I don't. I like, if anything, that backfires because when he gave the hundred thousand to each county board when Limerick won the All Ireland, I think Liveline had two days on. Sure, yeah. On, yeah. On like, how are we to feel about McManus? And uh, you know, on the back of this, these pieces get written. So, so I don't if, know. If it almost go, rebounds. If you, if you go away and have a problem with it, then you have look just from a sporting point of view. The Limerick thing changed it for me because his backing of their academy systems and his partial funding of and looking at that. That's changed the template of Irish sport. I know, of hurling. He's I, built I this. You, but he's pe- built this thing that I've been waiting to see from the GAA. Dublin did it, but Dublin can do it because it's it's Dublin. Yeah, yeah. But, but he's the, the first county to turn Limerick into this. I agree, this, but people would monster steam of like they have the better S S and C than any professional, or as good as any professional. Level. That's the first time it's really happened. I know, of but listen, the argument would go. So Arthur out there producing of Limerick would rather his tax money went to Limerick GAA than a mis- ministerial car. But as citizens, we don't get to make that choice. True. So. There you go. It's been written about today in the papers anyway. We're, There'll be a we're variety always, of opinions. We're always too worried in this country about other people's money. It's as simple as that. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> right. It ain't going to change the couple of notes I have in my pocket. That's all I know. So, Well, that is pretty much us done for the papers today. Fellas, really enjoyed that. A lot of people will listen to this on a Monday morning. Mm-hmm. Who's going to win at Crow Park today? Just so you can look foolish now, 24 hours on. Uh, personally, I think, Kerry... Is Khan going to show up, by the way? Are we hearing, that's, that's, are there, are there the, rumours that he is? That, that still? is the, the, the question or the, the debate at the moment. Um, I have 40 minutes to get there before throwing. Right. Yeah, 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 you <laughs> okay. do. We'll get you at the door in 30 seconds. I'm going to say Kerry. Kerry. If Clifford's anyway on it, yeah, unfortunately. Well, Pat Spillane has been saying in his, apart from t- having to talk about himself uh, today in the Sunday World, he's saying it's it's now in his, his sports section. Uh, it's time, essentially, for Kerry to stand up and deliver at this stage because they've been, as everybody else has been, kind of second fiddle to, to Dublin for the last couple of years and then Tyrone go and win it last year and mm. all that sort of thing. So if this if this carry outfit are any good... They won't get through this winter if they lose this one, will they? Well, I tell you what, it'll be, it'll be rough down there. <laughs> uh, that, it'll, be, it'll be nearly as bad as New Zealand for the next week. Uh-huh. So definitely head down for a break there over October if they don't. Yeah. So. OK, so two carries. Gavin Cumminski of the Irish Times, thank you very much. Are you going into Croker, Michael? No, I'm actually going to head home and, and try and catch a bit of it at home because by the time... I, sorry for you, Gavin. You know, are you on your bike or something like that? I'm going to run. Run, yeah. I think I'll run home. It'll be the best thing to do at this stage. Feet up. Well, thank you both so much for coming in. Gavin Cumminski of the Irish Times, Michael Lester, 